strong academic innovators. And being here at this learning institution, it's a requirement for all of us to partake in research at one point or another. And um, as researchers, we really want to promote that from, from the research end and enable those of you who, who are interested in partaking in this. So uh, we want, just want to encourage collaborations. This doesn't mean that there's necessarily going to be an opening in every lab that speaks during this presentation, but just to make everyone aware of what is available. And we really want to focus on the process of research. It's not easy to get started. When you have a great idea, you have to know how to handle the Office of Sponsored Programs. You have to know what SAGE is. You have to do, go, go through all these little steps that oftentimes make it, makes it seem impossible. So we just really want to streamline that process and help everyone to uh, achieve success in the research um, entity. So um, today we start with uh, Dr. Kavanaugh and Jen Hagen are going to be our first presenters. And they will talk, I guess the structure of each of these seminars, we're going to meet the first Monday of every month. And the structure will be to kind of hit on some literature highlights on the topic areas of interest to the presenters. We're going to review some of those weedy questions. So those, you know, hopefully that there will be some value added for just sitting in the room. You'll get some review that will help you prepare for those exams. Um, then there will be a, a presentation of actual research and a hi highlight of the research process, whether it's navigating through OSP or submitting that first grant, uh, adhering to deadlines, and then some time for discussion and questions. So we really hope this is um, a, just a valuable exercise for everyone. Um, we expect to see both, like I said, clinicians, researchers, and the resident populations here. And I see a, a mix already, so this is really great. So um, with that, I think I'll turn it over. Thanks, Andrea. Okay, thank you. So um, Andrea has given you the format. We're going to try and keep it to 45 minutes, try and get you out of here at 10 to give you 10 minutes before your next activity. So we'll be pulling the hooks on people who go too long. Um, I want to start with the section on OITE. You guys may have seen, I'm sure you go to authorbullets.com periodically as the deadline comes closer and closer, but there's a discussion going on there now about the 21% failure rate on part one boards in 2011. That's pretty scary failure rate. Um, it is uh, uh, changed from last year, the pass rate was uh, uh, 80% and this is down from the low 90s and there's a discussion as to just exactly why this is. Uh, is Doug still in the room? Uh, any, were you aware of these numbers? Yeah, so I don't know. It's something we might talk about uh, when there's a little more time, but I just want you uh, to be aware of that. So um, what I'll do each time is I'll prepare five at random OITE questions from the basic science part of the OITE. So I have five for you right now. So they're a little difficult to see, so I'll read them. An 85-year-old patient diagnosed with osteoporosis is begun on a bisphosphonate. Can you tell her about her risk of vertebral fractures after three years of treatment? Number one, go to Jen Hagen's Grand Rounds. That's definitely the right answer. But uh, amongst the ones that are offered here, remains the same, decreased by 20%, decreased by 40%, decreased by 60%, increased by 10%. What's the preferred answer? Need a volunteer? Otherwise, Paul is a volunteer. <laughs> Time is passing. The preferred answer is that it will decrease by 40%. Now, to answer this question, you almost have got to have read this paper, which is the randomized control trial of resedronate, where there's a variety of uh, changes at different times. But uh, at the, uh, they were asking, I think, for the, uh, three years. Whoops, excuse me, three years, thank you. So uh, they were asking for the three-year uh, change. And in three years, you can expect a decrease in the risk of osteoporotic fractures by 40%. Next one. Which of the following statements regarding articular cartilage is true? Cartilage is an isotropic material. Most of the water in articular cartridge, cartilage exists in the deep layers next to the calcified tissue. Cartilage only heals if the injury does not pass through the tide mark. Calcified cartilage is the only place that type 11 collagen is found. Cartilage exhibits stress shielding of the solid matrix components. 
Anybody got a firm preferred answer for that one? Gosh, I'm glad we did this. Guys, note these questions down. Okay, so the preferred answer is that cartilage exhibits stress shielding of the sol solid matrix components. I've got two things to show you about this answer. Um, first of all, let's just review what anisotropy is. And I've got this from bone rather than cartilage. So in this bone specimen, we take little coupons at various angles. If bone was isotropic and you stress these coupons, you'll get the same strain in every case. Okay? That would be an isotropic material. But you don't. You get more strain for the transverse load and you get least strain for the longitudinal coupon. So it shows you that bone is anisotropic. The stress strain curve depends which direction you're pulling in. And it's the same for articular cartilage. You take out a piece of articular cartilage, slice it transversely, and unload it. You get one answer, slice it longitudinally or AP, and you get a different stress strain curve. So that was the, the first question was that cartilage is isotropic. Answer, no it isn't. But then the real answer, the preferred answer, was stress shielding. So what the heck is stress shielding of the solid components? I've got two fairly uh, schematic examples here of a, of a joint where there's a solid component and nothing else. When you stress it, you will get concentrated stress on that solid component because there's nothing else around. When you pop that solid component inside a closed fluid compartment, as soon as you start to stress that joint, the hydrostatic pressure on the solid will be the same all the way around it because fluid is incompressible, the fluid is contained and bounded, so the stress will be the same in the whole of the closed container. So instead of one localized stress, you got stress distributed throughout the closed fluid container. And so the fluid is shielding the stress from the solid component. And that was the answer they wanted. That's the only correct answer from the answers that were there. Okay? All the rest are not true. Okay. Which of the following scenarios of treatment of a humeral fracture best achieves low strain at the fracture site and high stiffness of the treatment construct? Is it functional bracing of the transverse mid-shaft fracture? That's highly unlikely, right? Uh, a comminuted uh, mid-shaft fracture with a lock bridge plating, a short oblique fracture with an interfragmentary screw and locked neutralization plate, a uniplane external fixation of a spiral open fracture, or an oblique fracture with intermodullary nail fixation. Which of those gives you low strain at the fracture site and high stiffness of the con construct? This one can nail. Somebody knows this one. Yeah, right. Somebody can nail it. The clock's ticking, guys, and you're thinking, got a lot more questions coming. What's the answer? What, what number are you choosing? Three. Three. <laughs> Good job. Now to explain this one, I have two things I want to show you. So we have a hypothetical fracture site on the left hand side. First question is how the heck do you measure strain in a fracture site? We think of strain being in a material where it's, it's delta L over L. Well it's just the same thing at a fracture site, but the L is the fracture gap. So you take the starting length as the fracture gap. If there is strain and the fracture gap decreases, you've got a change in that gap, delta L, just like you were stressing a piece of intact bone. And then the strain is delta L over L times 100 if they want it expressed in percent. So that's just a restatement of how to calculate strain on a fracture. 
Now, back to that diagram we saw before, it enables us to answer the question of what is stiffness? So stiffness is the gradient of the stress-strain curve. So you can see that the anisotropy of bone is expressed by a stiffness which is less in this coupon and greatest in this coupon because it's the gradient. Now there's another name for that actually. It is synonymous with modulus of elasticity which you've all heard of. So the Young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity is the gradient of the stress strain curve. So you needed to know that to eliminate a couple of answers. And just for your information, the modulus of human cortical bone is typically said to be about 17 gigapascals. I'm sure you were really waiting to know that answer, but that may come up somewhere. All right, now uh, two to go, because um, I do have uh, another one. Uh, infliximab is a chimeric monoclonal antibody used to treat RA. What cytokine does it target? TGF-beta, TNF-alpha, CD20 antigen, IL-6, IL-1. You must know this one. Number, number two. That's the right answer. So uh, it is a, uh, uh, it is a, a, a TNF-alpha. Uh, they're thought to be major cytokines in RA, and these are uh, directed at TNF-alpha blockers or inhibitors. Uh, you might, if you want to follow up on this, might want to know that there is an online exclusive in the American Journal of Orthopedics this month on RA for orthopedic surgeons. So that's a quick place to look to revise your knowledge on uh, RA and RA treatment. Now this is just to prove to you that there really is a free lunch in the OITE. This is the most incredibly stupid question I think I've ever seen. I love it. A patient needs a total knee joint. He inquires about which prosthesis would be the best. What information should the surgeon base his opinion on? One, the short or long-term track record of a particular prosthesis of interest, the latest stock price of the manufacturing company, the personal preference of the local representative, love that one, the latest pending litigation that he's just heard on the news, and a recent paper written by biased authors. Oh, clearly number five is the answer. But how amazing that that's a real question. It's an almost an insult to your intelligence. So um, I won't even tell you what's the real answer to that one. Okay, section one, done. So I didn't hear a lot of answers to those first three questions. So hopefully you can take, I'll, by the way, I'll email you this whole presentation after today. So just get those answers and you're done with those questions should they ever pop up again. Now in section two, you get a lot of literature. You get the, uh, the core literature in orthopedics in some of your didactic sessions. So we thought what we would do in this session is highlight papers done by the faculty that you work with. Because I think in many cases you don't know the academic profile of the surgeons that you work with. You know how good they are uh, in the OR, you know how to interact with them, but perhaps you don't know about their research. So we're going to bring you one paper each time of one of your faculty members. And um, in the last six months, as uh, Dr. Chapman said, uh, our faculty have published 51 articles in referee journals. The impact factors of these journals varied from th uh, 30 to 1.09. Now, just a word about impact factors, because it's really important for you as you try to strategically choose where you want to publish your articles. What the impact factor means is that in the last year, an article appearing in JAMA in the last two years, so I know that sounds strange, but in the last year, there have been 30 citations to every article that appeared in JAMA over the last two years, okay? So what that means is it's a sort of visibility index for your article. It means that people have not only read it, but they have decided your article is worthy enough that they're gonna cite it in their own paper. Now there's huge discussion about this because it turns out that you can guess the most cited articles are reviewed. 
And review papers don't necessarily need the greatest academic brain in the world to uh, sit online and summarize 50 papers. Probably much more important that somebody had a brilliant idea that is included in those reviews. But nevertheless, it certainly is a criterion for you that if you have a, an article you want to publish, you need to put it at this stage in your career in the place where it's most visible, most people are going to read it, and most people are going to refer to it. So uh, the, the 30.1 is actually an article by uh, Dr. Carol Tice that she had in JAMA on shadowing surgeons. So it was a sort of a general article about uh, education of surgeons. The 1.09 was an article by Dr. Sanjorsen in Foot and Ankle. Now that's not to say that uh, Dr. Tights ha has 30 times more kudos uh, as an academic than Dr. Sanjorsen. It's a kind of fact of life that foot and ankle is such a tiny specialty that not many people refer to it. What do you think the highest ranked subspecialty is in orthopedics as far as citation index? Have a guess. Spine, close, but not right. Sports. That's the answer. Uh, the American Journal of Sports Medicine has an impact factor of about 3.6. That's as high as we go. That's, that's really disappointing when you think <laughs> that you put all that work into writing an article and in one year only 3.6 references to your magnum opus is going to appear in the literature. What you can do, sometimes when you're up for promotion or some other thing, you have to do a review of your, how many, not how many articles you published. Nobody really, people care about it. But what they really care about is what impact your articles have on the field. So citation index is a great way of establishing that. So I have done such a total citation index on every paper I've ever published. And it was the most humbling thing that I ever did because a paper that I thought was just the very best paper I'd ever written, it had like one citation in the last 10 years. Kind of scary. Makes you wonder, what are we doing this for? But uh, then you get other articles that for no reason have 50, 75 citations. But it's something to keep in mind, um, impact factors. So as you heard from Dr. Chapman, when we analyzed the data from the department in the last six months, uh, this was sort of overnight, I was horrified to find out that out of the 51 articles, which were divided between research faculty and clinical faculty, there was only a single article in which basic faculty, were, the science faculty, were collaborating with clinical faculty. You know, that really is not the way it should be. So I am depending on this group here to start to change the trend. Uh, Jen and I will have an article by 12 months time in the literature and we will be a 100% increase over the last six months. And I'm hoping that's true for the rest of you with your research mentors. Because as Jen's presentation will highlight today, even though we are really nerdy and we're really tough to work with, uh, there are, I think, because I saw your last slide, some benefits of working with basic faculty. So I told her I didn't want to see her slide about working with PhDs. All right, so I am going to highlight one article from the uh, uh, research faculty, and I want my bag, which disappeared way, way back there. Yeah. Um, this. So the article I've chosen is one which by Dr. Manna and uh, Dr. Leopold and Dr. Wolf. Was he a fellow here, uh, Jens Wolf? He's a resident. He's a resident. Great. All right. He was a resident. So um, Orthopedics Today, you probably all, this is one of those publications that pile up that they were talking about in the mailroom. You read it. That's good. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> yeah, the pictures are great. It's like why people say they read Playboy, you know, for the articles. Um, so uh, this one is a big one for UW this, uh, this time. You know this guy, Stan Herring, the director of Sports and Spine? He's a leading figure in the national debate on concussion. And there's an article about him in there and changes to uh, the recognition of concussion. 
And then on the back, there is a, an article where Doug Jackson, who's the editor of this, um, does an interview. Now, I've heard it on good authority that he doesn't read too much. And actually, if you're on this page, you supply both the questions and the answers. But be that as it may, um, uh, Dr. Manner and Dr. Leopold have appeared in this. And uh, it's their article on Markov uh, decision analysis in analyzing a two-stage revision for hip arthroplasty complicated by infection. And so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking to you about that article. So um, they point out that there are no randomized controlled trials contrasting a one-stage versus two-stage revision of a hip that is complicated by infection. And this is a key point that validates this article because there are a number of things we don't know through RCTs because people generally consider it's not quite ethical to do it. And this would be one of them. Because it's been well established that there is enhanced likelihood of infection if you do a one-stage procedure in this case. So the risk of infection if you do a one-stage versus two-stage is greater. So for many people, that's end of discussion. You've got to do a two-stage. But what this paper points out is there is much more to the whole picture than just whether there is a significant, statistically significant increase in infection from a one-stage versus a two-stage. So what they have done here is they have looked into the literature and found out that even though there's, no, though there's no RCT, there are many papers describing the outcomes and risk for various events in each procedure. I'll give you an example. In a two-stage procedure, how many times does the patient die between stage one and stage two? That would seem to be an important factor. You know, if they die infection-free, have you helped them compared to doing a one-stage replacement where they live with infection? So well, the way you figure this in a decision analysis is you calculate utility values to all the possible outcomes. So you say to a knowledgeable person involved in this, which would be in this case the patient or the surgeon, you say to the patient, how many years of life would you be prepared to give up if you could run a marathon for the next one year and then die? That's an outrageous example, but you see what I mean. So if the choice was that they could live for five years and they were in a wheelchair, or they could live one year and they could have an active life, the patient would choose a utility value for those two outcomes. Obviously, death is always a zero on the utility value. So you can get things like that from asking the question of patients and surgeons, and you can get the likelihood of certain events from the literature. Then what you do is you put it all together in a merit analysis to see what the big picture is on a treatment course rather than the small picture. So rather than just do you get more infections or not, you look at the big picture, which is the best of these treatments for the overall patient and the overall outcome. So here's what they did is the first thing to do is to identify every possible sequential endpoint or outcome that could happen. So for example, if you're going to do a staged revision, you do stage one, the patient has a wheelchair to the second surgery, they have the second surgery, and they have a successful revision. That's one possible path in this whole guideline. But of course, another uh, possible path is that they have the surgery and they die. Another possible path is that uh, they uh, have the surgery and they get infected and they die. So you have to try and identify every step in this process that requires an analysis of its value and its cost and its likelihood. And on this diagram, the green fields are all chance nodes and the red nodes are all terminal states. So your job as a 
an academic surgeon considering this whole question is to assign probabilities to the green boxes and then to assign values to all the red boxes. So how much value is it for the patient to have gone through this particular path to a successful revision? Okay. This is a question that often comes up in limb salvage. Um, in an area that I'm interested in is diabetic feet. So how much value is it to a patient to have a five-year series of treatments considering every possible modality and then finally to have a transtibial amputation? How much value is there in that to having had the transtibial amputation at month one? So you can see that the patient would likely, if they knew the outcome of the five-year treatment, they certainly would have given higher value to the BKA initially. So that's the kind of process that they went through. Now, what they found, and this is very counterintuitive finding, they found out that the 12 month and the 10 year life expectancy models, they both favored direct exchange over the two stage approach. So even though the risk of infection is greater in the one stage approach, when you look at this big picture, they, the, they both, short term and long term, favored the direct exchange. And the results were robust to sensitivity analysis. What does that mean? So all of those probabilities that are assigned to the green nodes, it could be that one or two of those was biasing the outcome so much that the results are not meaningful. So what you do is you go back and you perturbate the probability at every green node. You say, okay, this had a probability of 0.5, but let's suppose it was 0.7. Would that, on its own, totally change the outcome? And they did that systematically for all the green nodes, and the outcome was robust to perturbation. Now, it's not, I should say not, not no, this is not considered to be a practice-changing study. So there was not a recommendation, and this point's made in the Orthopedics Today article, that everybody goes out and now does one-stage procedures for infected hips. What the value of this study is, is to say, look, we have a suggestion here that despite the evidence on infection, the better overall outcome is if you ignore that and do the one-stage procedure. So now, the RCT that I mentioned to you at the outcome that was thought to be perhaps unethical, now people are going to read this article and they're going to say, well, how about that? You know, we always thought it was an open and shut case. More infection, better do the one-stage procedure. So what this has done is it has opened the door to the possibility of an RCT comparing directly head-to-head, -head, one stage versus two stage. So, that's the article. Um, if you have any questions about it, better not to ask me, but better to ask Dr. Manna, Dr. Leopold when you bump into them. And at the very least, you can get definite brownie points by telling them you know all about this article and you think it's great. <laughs> so, uh, we will be doing more uh, introduction to faculty science in each one of these sessions. All right, that's section two. Section three, multidisciplinary research. Introducing Dr. Hagen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the acronyms that have been thrown out this morning and all of the committees that you find when you're doing research and all the people that need to approve your protocols before you do it. And also just some pointers that I've figured out and a lot of you have worked in labs know about um, dealing with people in other departments. I don't know if this is working. Um, it, it, it's oh, sorry. Recorded. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. It'll be just fine. Okay. So, Dr. Kavanaugh has already discussed a little bit about this, but why do we care so much about multidisciplinary research? Um, it's in a couple parts. Uh, what we've noticed, what works in the lab doesn't always play out in vivo. And a lot of times, people, engineers, physicists design things that make no sense once you get them into the operating room. Also, on our part, clinical research is often scientifically unsound, which we all know. It's flawed or it's not reproducible. So they do great science that isn't always useful, and we do poor science that 
sometimes it's poor science. So this is a move to combine the expertise of hard science researchers and medical professionals to maybe come up with a product that works well for both sides the first time out of the gate. So these are some tips and tricks that I found working with PhDs, PhD candidates, and other uh, non-clinicians. They follow the science. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is more for them too. So they follow the scientific method, something that we learned back in high school and college. Um, hypothesis, theory, test it, results. It's very, it's not very straightforward, but it's very systematic and it's something that we, some of us tend to lose as we go on through medical training. They have skills and knowledge that far exceeds and extends our scope. There are computer programs out there that I've never even heard of. There's math out there that once upon a time I might have learned and they have mastered. So they have skills that are well beyond things that we can take the time to kind of figure out at our, on our own. Best way to do uh, is to have a specific answerable question that is very difficult to come up with in medicine and that's some of the things that they can help you with. But that really is something that a lot of them require of us, which is a reasonable thing to request, and it's something that can be difficult for us to provide. Um, understand that while they do have an excellent understanding of some aspects of medicine and, and anatomy, um, they don't always understand right off the bat the clinical context of your project. So while you have something in your head of, oh, I see why this is going to help in the operating room, or we're going to put this in the knee this way, they don't always understand why you're using an implant or why this is actually a problem in a patient. So a lot of communication is helpful. You're not their only responsibility. They're not there just to make our projects work. They have their own lab and their own project and this is probably a, a duh, but they also don't work surgeons hours. So sometimes you have to accommodate the fact that they're not going to be there in the lab at midnight. And most of them have at least one grant, so they've all been through this process before. It can help a lot. So this, again, is just a short list of all the scientific labs available to us. Um, there is an applied biomechanics lab that I think has an uh, office down on South Lake Union. Multiple, multiple labs, uh, including CORE, which is Dr. Kavanaugh's lab, and he'll talk a little bit more about that with you. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the physics machine shop, which is this terrific shop anytime you want. If you want a piece, something made, something metal. I need this to connect this to that. These guys are the ones that can do it. They can fabricate anything and they're really, really, really great about it. So the core lab um, is a multiple disciplinary team. Uh, PhDs, PhD candidates, they have a lot of graduate students uh, that they hire. The good thing about that is that they're students, so they're very excited. The bad thing about that is that eventually they graduate and then they go away. So, which is one of the problems I've run into. So <laughs> it's a great lab, but that's something that you need to remember. Lots of computer engineers or software programmers who can actually write code for you, code that doesn't exist, which is phenomenal. They have mechanical engineers, mathematicians, and statisticians. Amongst the things that they look into, computational modeling, finite element analysis, robotics, motion analysis, space flight simulation, and a multitude of other projects that they're looking into. Uh, and again, years of experience with grant writing and publications. I can't emphasize enough how m important this is because the process can be very arduous. So, uh, in the process, everyone here has at least heard of the IRB. You may or may not have been through the IRB. One of the big questions is, which project needs IRB approval? And the answer is, any project involving human subjects. Lies. Correct. Correct, yeah, so the things that require IRB, any data, uh, specimens, identifiable patient information, even chart review, chart review on live patients require an IRB approval. Uh, any in investigational device, drug, biologic, anything that's going to be implanted in a person has recently come out of a person who's going to affect a person needs an IRB approval. And just a point of contention, when you're doing research at the, VA, uh, at the VA, you need an IRB both of the VA and of UW. Because you are a UW resident, you need to get the IRB from both institutions. So it's a little extra step. There's something called the IRB Minimal Risk Review, which is a somewhat expedited version of this, uh, where you don't have to jump through quite as many hoops as you would for a regular IRB. Um, those that qualify for a minimal risk, uh, again, obviously, research that proposes minimal risk. You're not going to maim or kill these people. Not classified, so no governmental classified research. Uh, you can't work on prisoners um, unless they were already going to get worked on. 
So specifically, information taken for subjects medical charts, so data review, chart review, these can qualify for a minimal risk review, which is really helpful. And if you happen to be looking at any pathology or data that was already collected, um, patient follow-up, quality assurance type data can actually qualify for a minimal risk review, which can speed things a little bit. All right, so you have your idea, you have your collaborator, how are you going to pay for it? Uh, so some faculty at the University of Washington at are allocated something called a AAA account. This is money that they have accrued through other grants. This is a source that they have that they can use to pay for some research. Uh, at Harborview, they just started a new system called RRR. It's a little bit more painful than the AAA, and you can use the money from it, but it just there's a few other steps that you need to deal with. Uh, as you know, grants, sponsorship, great way. Um, if you get a grant, it looks great on your CV. It also makes you a more attractive collaborator to work with with faculty because you're coming in with money. And I think Dr. Kavanaugh has stressed that a lot. So grants are available through a variety of societies. ORIF is a big one. They give out a lot of grants. But any subspecialty society, Arthroscopy Association, all of those societies have grants. For the females in the room, if you're not a member of the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society yet, it is a girls-only club. Um, you know, irrespective of how you feel about that, they do give grants. So it's an important thing to uh, apply for and also be a part of. Do they? Oh, well, there you go. Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Shot. Um, an important thing that I found uh, specifically, I think I remember the Arthroscopic Association, some granting agencies. If you do publish your work based on their grant, sometimes they want you to publish in their paper first. Sometimes they want you to present at their uh, society meeting first. So just when you're kind of, you know, shotgun, oh, I need to get some money, just make sure that you're not pu promising this to too many places because some of them do put restrictions on whether you can present it. So let me make a, a statement here. Uh, you are not to submit your grant without talking to me. And I don't do that just because I want to be in charge. I do that because I can increase your likelihood of getting a grant funded. So there was a, a couple of occasions in the last year where I just found out after the fact that somebody had submitted a grant. Now it turns out they were successful, which was fantastic. But I think that my office can increase your likelihood of success. So don't just choose a specialty society and say, oh, I'm going to submit a grant there. Come and talk to me. And the process you'll, you'll hear from Jen and from Amy later, we'll get that all going for you and we'll review your text and we'll make sure that you've got the very best chance of getting funded. So don't be uh, a lone agent here. Come and talk to me and the resources in my office are there to increase the likelihood of you getting funded. Uh, that's what we did with Jen. Absolutely. And, uh, and she got a very prestigious OER, OREF resident. Yeah, no, a absolutely. I mean, they knew all the loops, including in this loop where the University of Washington regulates residents applying for grants in which you're named as the PI. A lot of grants require that the person applying for it is the PI, and the UW has some stipulations on that. So that's one of the extra kind of loops that you need to hop through, and they're really good about knowing how to do that. And when she says regulate, she means does not Doesn't allow. allow. Yes. <laughs> so regulates strenuously. Yeah. It's crazy, but you can't. Right. Um, so some of the other acronyms I've thrown out, CRBB, it's something that you may or may not hear about depending on what project you're doing. It's called the Clinical Research Budget and Billing Support. So these, uh, this department regulates all of the billing. So if you're working with a sponsor, a device company where they are paying you per person that you enroll, this CRBB are the ones that make sure that you get paid and they make sure that everything is above board. Um, they kind of allocate the study charges, who gets paid what. Again, this is for the bigger studies where you're actually using sponsors and you have multiple members in the team that need to be paid based on what you're doing from the funding. So this, I believe, is only comes in play when human subjects are actually involved, uh, living human subjects. So unless you're doing a live person trial, it's not as... Dr. Sanjay. You're correct in everything you've said there, but you also need CRBB approval, even if you're not doing anything in the study that has anything to do with the research. So if you're following a clinical patient, but no part of the grant has anything to do with the clinical procedures, you still need to go through this process. It takes many hours to fill it out just so they can have a zero charge for each of the patient. Right. Thank you. 
All right. OSP is the other acronym that you hear this morning. It's called the Office of Sponsored Programs. So this is um, everything needs to be approved by Dr. Kavanaugh, but everything absolutely needs to be approved by them. So they are kind of the final say. Once you have the grant, once you've been uh, processed by CRBB, once you have the IRB approval, the Office of Sponsored Programs is the final one that says, okay, yes, you can do this study. So they review, negotiate, approve everything that has to um, do with any type of outside funding outside of the University of Washington. So everything needs to go through them. They have this form called the EGC-1. It's, they'll talk a little bit more about it, but it's, you can't get around this office and nothing is going to go through if they don't approve it. All right, again, so just kind of an overview. One way of looking at the process of research, so the person's research idea, which is only one block, but it can be one of the most difficult parts. Write a proposal, figure out who's going to be working with you, which lab, not just which surgical mentor, but which actual bioscience mentor is going to be working with you. Decide if you need the IRB. Go down the IRB pathway, get your approval done before you even worry about a grant because there's no point getting money for a project that's not going to get approved. Then you worry about your funding. Does your attending have money that, they that you can use or are you going to have to look for outside funding? Then you have to write a whole other grant proposal, go through the OSP and go through CRBB. So final thoughts. Engineers and physicists work in absolutes. There's no eyeballing or close enough, which is a little different sometimes in surgery. Sometimes we can, you know, there's a little bit of art to it. There is art to science, but it's a little more finite. And again, there are a huge variety of resources. There's tons of brilliant people out there working that have their own labs, have their own ideas, and are super excited. And if we get to work with them, I think that's actually a huge coup for us. So thank you. Jen, that was fantastic. Really great. Thank you. Now, uh, how did she get to know all that stuff? Well, she got to know it because she started on the road extremely early. Almost the first day Jen was on campus as an R1, she came to my office. We both happened to have been in Cleveland at the same time, working half a mile away from each other, but we didn't know it. Um, so we had something in common to start with. But y if you're not convinced already, Amy will convince you a little more, but if you're not convinced already that there's a huge bureaucracy that's imposed on this research process, you, you, you will be soon. And having your idea is only part of it. Now, Jenna suffered a lot because I was in the startup phase of my lab. This is my third year here and I sort of created something from nothing here. And so Jenna's had to be there while, you know, we couldn't get this working, the robot was sick and, you know, all the things. And it's only now in the next six months that all the effort she put in to learn all this stuff, do all this stuff, get her grant, is going to bear fruit. If you are an R4 and think that, you know, I think I'll stop my research in six months, it isn't going to happen. So I hope that besides the message of uh, what the pathways are, I hope a big message here is that you realize that the federal government mostly, but the state government and the university has put a lot of roadblocks which might convince you that they don't actually want us to do research. And if you try to reinvent the wheel and go through all those processes by yourself, it's not going to happen. So in addition to the creative things that we can help you with, we can also help you with your animal protocols, your human subject protocols, your CRBBs, your all that stuff that you really don't want to know about. You just want to get on and do research. Uh, come and see us and we'll try and help you through it. So, Finally, the last one, and we'll see if we can be true to our promise of getting you out here in 50 minutes or so, is uh, Amy Sizek. Amy wasn't here uh, when we started. This is Amy Sizek. She's the co-organizer of this. Um, while she, Amy's coming up, I'll mention, let all the other basic researchers that are here uh, identify themselves. Alan, and tell us what you do. Alan? Alan Tensor, I do lab Amy and I work in the Sciences Lab here. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Brandon Osk, I'm a PhD candidate and I work in the orthopedic <coughs> science laboratory. Edith Gardner, I'm in the orthopedic science laboratory. I'm a cell biologist and molecular biologist working on neural control. Ted? Ted Gross in the OSL, uh, bone biology and mechanical transduction. Thomas? Thomas Spork, I'm a finite element analyst in the field of science. Who'd I miss? And of course, uh, let, how about uh, Darren? Uh, I don't know if you've ever, uh, have met Dr. Davidson. Hi, um, Darren. So I'm 
on the clinical research epidemiology side of things and particularly interested in uh, quality of life outcomes measures that type of research but certainly happy to help you know even if it's just talking over an idea bouncing an idea off to somebody else and a great role model for clinical researcher, Dr. Uh, Sanjo Ozen? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? You know, I work with Bill Ledoux, who's got a really great gait simulator at the VA, so trying to get that. You know, of My planer on a tool for looking at motion analysis, it's not, probably still not for six months away from being possible to do that. Okay, thanks. Last topic, section four. Um, it feels like this American life, doesn't it? You know, you don't that way. Like, even in section one, section two. Uh, Amy Sizek's going to talk to you about navigating the submission. And I'm really going to try to blow through this because I have to get to class because I started my PhD last week. So, um, all right, navigating research at UW. So I'm going to kind of pull back from what Jen said and just talk about kind of resources you can use at the U that are already in place. Um, so OSP, or Office of Sponsored Program, Jen briefly mentioned that, is kind of the grandfather of research here at UW. They have a brand new website. It's really a lot more navigable. Um, so we're going to quickly talk about the right side, the blue links. Um, so there's a Sponsored Programs link, Human Subjects, I won't get into that today, um, and then SAGE, and we'll talk about what that is. So um, hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, the Office of Sponsored Program uh, has the big part of what they do is you need to, s it, the SAGE system, so you can see it kind of on the bottom, and it's the system to ma administer grants uh, electronically. And this gets into the EGC1 acronym that Jen talked about, and it's basically a grant and contract form that you need to put and fill out in UW's format so they know who you're paying, who's on the grant, the scope of the work, um, and I'll show you a brief form, and I don't think we'll have time to really get to it today, but um, anyway. So, and also if you're looking for funding, this is a great way to start looking for funding. Again, in orthopedics, Orthopedic Research Education Foundation is probably a good place to start. Um, NIH will come later in your career, but this is a good way to just start looking for opportunities. They have a, um, they can give you, you can get email lists for opportunities, that kind of thing. Uh, so this is what an EGC-1 actually looks like, and you can see one this is, I've worked on with Dr. Lee. Um, so you put your PI, your contacts, um, usually um, the big thing a lot of people don't know in our department is we have this business office who this has to go to first, uh, and they can also help you with funding and what people's salary lines are and things like that. Um, I'm trying to think anything else to highlight here. No. So cost sharing. I did want to briefly talk about cross, cost sharing. So that is an issue that comes up in, in um, people that work on the clinical side of things. You have to document your time. Um, so your PIs, your attendings, they have to share their clinical time with their research time and it has to be documented. And again, our business office will help you work through that process. You can't initiate or view an EGC-1 until Tom Zorish office has got you approved. So if you're thinking of applying for a grant anytime in the future, just send an email to Tom Zorich, say you want to access SAGE, and he'll set it all up for you. So this is the big thing I wanted you to take from my talk today, is this stuff takes time. I think Jen has really highlighted that. Research takes time. You don't get that immediate feedback like you get in the OR. Um, it can take six months to a year to even get grant funding, proposals, all of that going before you can even start your research. So some advice that I've learned be being here seven years, um, I think if I could tell everyone if you could start two weeks before your deadline to get this stuff going, that's great. If you could start a month before, that'd be even better. But the, you, as you can see here, here's an approval flow of what needs to happen when you submit these EGC-1s. Um, so your PI, your attendee needs to approve it first, then it goes on to our business office. They'll look at your budgets and make sure everything looks right. Um, then I also highlighted on this one, I think it's important for you to know, some of our professors have joint appointments, so their joint department also has to review this and look at this. Um, I, on this one in particular, I was partnering with somebody in bioinformatics, their department had to approve and look at this. So you can imagine the time it takes, people have to open these, look at these. Some people look, that's it, and they close it and approve it. Sometimes there's questions, feedback, it comes back to you, you need to edit and, and fix things. 
Then we're, because we're under the school medicine, goes to the school medicine. They then have to approve it. Then it goes to the Office of Sponsored Programs. And then they take two or three days to make sure everything looks well. The nice thing is you can get this, this side of it going before you finish the entire proposal. So scope of work, meaning um, uh, you know, your res research methodologies. The actual research part does not have to be finalized. Let but the budgets you, do. The horror story that happened to me last week. I spent a month trying to develop new collaborators for a grant I was submitting to NASA. They wouldn't, and they wouldn't, and they wouldn't respond. They finally responded with two business days to go. I submitted my grant. I got an email back saying, sorry, you might have worked really hard on this, but we're just not going to submit it. So I had to go through a whole procedure where Dr. Chapman had to write a letter, an email to the director of grants and contracts, a big mess. Finally, they said, OK, I guess we can do it. So don't get into the situation that I got into. Because all your work, they can actually refuse and will stand on it. So Amy's numbers here should be considered the absolute minimum. Mm -hmm. um, and just my last slide is our contacts. So um, oh, good, I'm glad you had it. <laughs> so of course, Dr. Kavanaugh um, it should be your first step. Uh, our business office, is, Tom Zorch is our contact there. Janelle Douglas at School of Medicine, hardly ever interact with her. She may find a, you know, oh, you have a spelling error here, just so you know. But they're pretty much there as kind of just to oversee and make sure that the School of Medicine interests are represented. And then um, we now have a new representative in OSP, Jessica Brassi, who I've had great interactions with. Um, they do want to work with you. They do want to make things easy. It doesn't feel that way sometimes, but they really do want to make sure that we do get our funding and, and get research going. So. One That's other roadblock you can face, it may not apply to any of you, or it may, if you have any financial conflict of interest, get money from a patent from Zimmer, you cannot submit a grant until you've filed what's called a GIM 10, which says you have a conflict and says how you're going to resolve it. It has to go to the dean, it has to go to the medical school. There's another two to three weeks. So that is a deal breaker. Dr. Chapman can write all the letters he wants. And if a GIM 10 has not been filled in when you have a conflict, Grant doesn't go. OK, Andrew, you want to close any remarks? Um, sure, thanks. All right, um, just a huge thanks to all the presenters. I think that gives everyone a, just a really great overview of um, one, what we're trying to accomplish in this research seminar, and two, how broad this process of research really is. And they have had a lot of success on between the three of them um, that presented today. And so great resources, use them, use us, use us early, um, and we wish you all the greatest success. So just a big thanks to Dr. Kavanaugh, Dr. Chapman, and Dr. Hanel for supporting this, and we'll see you at the first Monday in November. <laughs>